All right. Good morning, everybody. Before we get started with our formal day two of our uh, webinar series, I just wanted to again remind everybody of a few housekeeping items, uh, digitally speaking. Uh, the first is that our Q&A function is still active today. We're going to use that primarily for specific questions if you have them, if you don't want to raise your hand and speak out loud. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, you will also see the raise hand option, which if you raise your hand, uh, yesterday we did have issues with it. I hope we figured out the issues today. So if you raise your hand, I'll be able to unmute you and we can have you verbalize your question. Um, I have 100% secured the fact that the chat will work today. I have settings such that everybody can see everything. So we will try to use that a little bit more robustly today. Um, and as you heard, uh, we are recording this uh, event as well. Um, our goal is to have that up after all of the web uh, webinars are complete. So here by the end of the week. Um, and then also because this is a webinar, unless uh, the host unmutes you, you will be on mute, except for the six panelists that you see on your screen here today. Uh, with that, uh, I will turn our screen control over to Dr. Michael Schuck, and I will uh, have Jamie proceed with the introduction for today's webinar. Thanks, Jared. Good morning and welcome back and welcome everyone to our seminar on ecology and land restoration, connecting science, ethics, spirituality, and action. This ecology and land restoration seminar consists of three webinars over the next three days, but now we only have two days, and it's going to be a discussion and reflection on care for creation and the poor. Our seminar is inspired by the Presentation Sisters Prairie Restoration Project, which takes place on the land, which is the ancestral homelands of the Ochechi Shak Owin, meaning the seven council fires of the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota people, also known as the Great Sioux Nation. And most notable, the groundbreaking encyclical writings of Pope Francis, Laudato Si. With that being said, we would like to now um, introduce, um, I think we introduced this yesterday, but I'm gonna keep saying it along the way, our IAJU International Association of Jesuit Universities 2022 Lifetime Achievement Award winners, <laughs> Dr. Nancy Tuckman, founding Dean of Loyola University Chicago School of Environmental and Sustainability, and Dr. Michael Schuck, Professor, Department of Theology and School of Environmental Sustainability. And my partner in crime, co-director Jared mm -hmm. Hone, we're the Integral Ecology Director with the Presentation Sisters of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And now before we get started, I would like to have Sister Roxanne Seifert of the Presentation Sisters of the Blessed Virgin Mary open with a few words and a prayer. Sister Roxanne. Thank you, Jamie. Good morning, everybody. Um, again, for those returning, welcome back. For those who might be attending this webinar for the first time, welcome to you. Um, we had a wonderful uh, webinar yesterday. You'll be able to watch that after the recordings are done and we're really happy to have you back. Let us begin by placing ourselves in the presence of God, recognizing that God is with us always. From the, from the prophet Isaiah, I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. As we consider the human impact on our earth, we pray together. Confront us, creator God, with the results of our treatment of the earth. Disturb us with the science. Unsettle us with the global impact statistics. Enable us to change and walk gently on our common home. Assure us that every action counts. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Oxan. All right, Michael, the floor is yours.
Great. Thank you, Sister Roxanne and, and uh, uh, Jamie and Jared. Is, uh, I'm Mike Shook, and it's great to be back with, with all of you. And uh, hopefully there's some uh, new uh, people that are joining us. And, and thanks so much for those that were with us yesterday to uh, return. And, and, and thanks to uh, Sister Vicki and Mary and Maria and Maurice and Rita and uh, Kylie and others who uh, put in question and answer uh, comments. Uh, and uh, uh, we got to look at those last night and I really appreciated those comments and um, enjoyed looking through them. So I hope I've got some more to look at this evening. Uh, we here at uh, Loyola where Nancy and I um, work, uh, we also uh, want to acknowledge that, uh, you know, we're working on the ancestral homelands of the Potawatomi people. And uh, we, we want to do everything we can to be allies to that ongoing community here at Loyola. I want to uh, just quickly go through uh, some of the basic uh, kind of background thoughts that led us to this seminar. Uh, it'll be somewhat uh, repeating what many of you heard yesterday, but I'll, I'll kind of move through it uh, um, quickly. Really, the inspiration behind this seminar was this quote from Laudato Si, uh, Pope Francis, concerning our, our relationship with God, our neighbors, and then how the earth is really entwined in that relationship. And we have to bring a kind of, we really have to work at a new consciousness of that, of that entwining of the earth into our relationship with God and our neighbor. And one way to do that, following Pope Francis, is to kind of pay a little bit more attention to the earth and its specific challenges. Yesterday, we looked at biodiversity, and uh, today we're going to look at water. And uh, tomorrow, it'll be global climate change. And we're looking at it from a particular perspective that Pope Francis encourages us to look at uh, as a lens to use, and that is this lens of integral ecology. And that's an approach that really calls for us to join our care for creation with our concern for the poor and future generations. And, even, and more specifically, how we're challenged to do that is to take serious earth science, to really, to bring to our attention uh, our moral responsibilities and, and to, to bring our souls to bear on, on both what the earth presents us and, and what our what our moral challenges are in our spiritual lives, and then to act. This is what constitutes integral ecology, and and it is really uh, something. It, it's about becoming citizen integral ecologists. Uh, Nancy is a professional ecologist, uh, well studied with her degree and, and many publications. Uh, but really, integral ecology is a matter of how we practice our citizenship today. And uh, we have to think again of, of the relationship between our environment and, and our, our role as citizens in a democracy. Healing Earth is our kind of background text to, to uh, help uh, animate our imaginations. If you have a chance to look at the introduction, the biodiversity chapter, today we'll be drawing from some of the water chapter and the climate change chapter. This is kind of the, the, the mothership for our adventure into uh, trying to discern uh, integral ecology uh, consistent with the work of Pope Francis. So we're gonna look at water today and, and we're gonna start with uh, looking at it from the scientific, uh, raising some scientific uh, uh, and empirical uh, data about that. And our questions here will be, or our, our topics will be to look at water on, on the prairie, uh, on the prairie environment, and then to move into some of the really concrete uh, dimensions of water as both a gift and a challenge on, on presentation heights. And Nancy's gonna start us with uh, discussing, uh, helping us understand water and its relationship to a prairie environment. So Nancy? Thank you, Michael. 
as an aquatic ecologist, I um, I study lakes and streams and wetlands and um, with a, a pretty heavy focus on the Great Lakes, but it's all in the context of the hydrologic cycle, how water uh, moves through the hydrologic cycle, which is one of Earth's big major important systems, uh, um, one of Earth's systems. And so I wanted to start this conversation just by looking at this as something everybody's familiar with, how um, water moves through the earth into the atmosphere where it, um, uh, um, water in the form of, of gas or um, humidity kind of um, rises up where it cools and condenses and then comes back down as precipitation, either as rain or, or snow, and then, you know, sort of flows through the earth and comes back up again. So this cycle is incredibly important. And it also um, is the driver for the way in which water is distributed, rain and snow are distributed on the earth. So in the next sl slide, you will see um, the distribution of precipitation because of the trade winds primarily, but you can see the dark blue and purple areas are where we get the most rain. And that's also where you find ecosystems such as the tropical rainforests that are supported by year round, um, you know, annual precipitation. The areas that are sort of more of a, um, a yellow green color are what we would call arid environments. And so those are, um, you know, both the Arctic tundra, but also are um, the main deserts of the world. The next slide shows you the distribution of the world's biomes. And so these are the major kind of ecosystems that are located in different kind of bands, if you will, horizontal um, bands or latitudinal bands around um, the planet. But what you'll see here and what I want you to focus on are the savannas and grasslands because that's the ecosystem that dominates South Dakota where we're sort of doing some of our focusing this week. So, um, you'll see a big swath of kind of light green in the western part of the United States and up into Canada. So we have one of the largest temperate grasslands on the planet. Um, and there's another big swath of that that is at about 45 degrees north um, along uh, Siberia and um, you know it, the eastern part of Europe. The next slide shows you kind of pulls out those grasslands so that we don't have the interference of all the other forested biomes. But now you can see where the grasslands of the world um, are found. So they're in semi-arid areas where you get somewhere between 10 and 30 inches of water per year. The temperate grasslands are in the cooler climates and you see that great big U-shaped swath of temperate grasslands that we have here in the United States and, and going up into Canada, down into Mexico, but then also um, in Eastern Europe, the big long swath that you see there as well. And of course, the savanna and the tropical grasslands that we're familiar with in Africa and um, in, in some of the Southern hemisphere as well. But we're going to focus today on the temperate grasslands and why they're so important and how water impacts them. They don't have, they don't get enough rainfall to support a lot of trees. So you don't see big forested biomes here um, in these areas, but there's enough water and the plants that grow in these grasslands are, are so well conditioned to low um, precipitation that they're designed to hold on to water. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we proceed. Next slide. Um, this is just to remind us that um, the, the previous few slides are sort of um, what precipita global precipitation has looked like over the past 12,000 years and how that's changing as we put more and more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and cause uh, the globe to warm. We will see um, 
global warming profoundly affect the evaporation of water from oceans and from land that will cause much more um, you know, cloudiness, the precipitation patterns will increase in, in their intensity and um, in their frequency as well. Next slide. So climate change will cause both more intense precipitation events in certain parts of the world. And the darker blue here shows you where that precipitation will occur. Um, some of it will occur in South Dakota and in the United States, especially in the um, mid to Northern part of our continent. Um, and at the same time, global climate change causes more severe droughts in other parts of the world. And the next slide shows us where we can expect there to be drier um, areas. And it's kind of unfortunate that a lot of it is in sub-Saharan Africa where they already um, don't, don't receive enough precipitation for growing crops, example, for example. But you'll see that if we look over in the United States, in the Great Lakes area, um, kind of in in the um, kind of in the Midwest, but from the from the north up into Canada, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, we will expect there to be more rain, less drought, and and more rain. Um, that is simply the the pattern that we will expect to find with uh, global climate change. So we can expect more rain in South Dakota and in the area where Mike and I live uh, in the Great Lakes. Next slide, please. Um, I know you've all seen this slide before. It's pulled off of um, Google, but it's so, I think it's so informative of the way in which prairie plants have adapted to the arid, the semi-arid environment that they have. They, they have so much more below ground biomass than they have above ground biomass, which is not the case with agriculture crop plants that we, uh, that we plant in place of these prairies. Um, it's also really not the case with trees. Trees tend to have approximately the same amount of biomass underground as they have above ground. But these prairie plants have um, about two times as much below ground biomass as above ground biomass. This is really important when it comes to water and water infiltration and water storage. When, when you get a flooding situation, and I remember yesterday, Jeremy, uh, sorry, Jamie and Jared were kind of concerned about the flooding that happened early on in the spring on the property of the Presentation Sisters because they thought it was going to kill their plants. But actually, um, when a prairie gets inundated with water, you will see standing water and it will slow down the growth for a while. But those roots that go so deep are um, helping the water follow those, each one of those little roots down deep into the water, or down deep into the soil. So the prairie plants are helping with the infiltration of rainwater down into the soil. And you don't usually see standing water in prairies permanently. You know, it, it tends to, you know, it'll take a little while, but it will infiltrate down and it goes deep enough that it can actually um, be helpful to water those plants throughout the growing season. So having prairie plants versus our conventional cropland plants, you can see how shallow the agriculture um, crops are rooted really helps to reduce surface runoff in um, storm events, which we can expect there to be more of during as climate change advances. And it increases the resistance and the resilience to both droughts and flood. So this is a really important feature of prairie ecosystems. Next slide, please. I wanna talk a little bit about how crop agriculture impacts water, not just where we plant the crops, but far downstream, you know, with, within our watersheds. So you see what happens underground as we convert our grassland ecosystems to crop agriculture. We have a lot less of that water infiltration because we basically 
um, we will th those roots will not last forever once you know you 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 cut off their tops they're going to die pretty quickly and that water infiltration will will also be decreased because of that and then when you convert it to cropland that have very shallow crops the infiltration property really um is is taken away and what that means is that crop land crops are not diverse they're not that makes the ecosystem so it's very it's not very resistant it's not very resilient so you have to give it a lot of inputs you have to feed it with fertilizer you have to water it with irrigation you have to add herbicides and pesticides you know to keep um, pests away so they're very high maintenance there's a lot of um, environmental impact and input to those systems and that has a very negative impact on the water system on the quality of the water the next slide shows us the entire water basin or watershed of the Mississippi River. And it's made up of multiple river basins that all are tributaries to the main branch of the Mississippi, which kind of starts uh, up in, um, I guess it's Bemidji, Minnesota, and, and sort of runs right down to New Orleans where the mouth of the Mississippi River is. But look at all of the land and the, the Missouri River Basin, the big red one is the one that you can see uh, the total of South Dakota is sitting within that Missouri River Basin. So all of the land use within the entire river basin of the Mississippi is impacting the quality of water that coalesces and flows into the Mississippi River and ultimately comes out the mouth of the Mississippi in the Gulf of Mexico. The next slide shows you how much of that Mississippi River basin is has been converted into farmland and all of this farmland is conventional meaning that it has a high footprint on the environment. It's reduced biodiversity by, by planting monocultures, um, compacted the soil with heavy machinery, which means less infiltration of water and more runoff. And then by adding fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides, a lot of those chemicals run off into the water. And of course, all of it ultimately um, enters into the, the uh, mouth of the river in the Gulf of um, Mexico down there in New Orleans. And the next slide shows you the impact of all of the fertilizer runoff from the Mississippi watershed to the life in the Gulf of Mexico, especially the near shore life. When fertilizers come dumping into the Gulf of Mexico there, it stimulates the growth of the algae and the bacteria to the extent where when the algae die and kind of settle down to the bottom of the, the kind of the shallow zones, and then the, those algae get decomposed by bacteria, the bacteria take all the oxygen out of the water column and make it an anaerobic waterway. All of that red that you see, which is a total of 6,000 square miles is anaerobic water. That means there's no life in there of the shellfish and other kinds of fish that would otherwise live in that water. So we call it a dead zone. And this is directly happening because of the, you know, the high intensity, high footprint agricultural practices that we have in the Midwest. And um, Illinois is one of these states that adds way too much nitrogen pollution to our waterways as well. The next slide reminds us of the importance of the biodiversity of grassland ecosystems, their ability to help water infiltrate so that it doesn't go running off into the Mississippi River. And I love these statistics because they're kind of shocking. A native tall grass prairie can absorb nine inches of rainfall per hour before any runoff occurs. Well, you can have a major storm event and you won't see runoff because of that massive infiltration um, that's aided by the roots. One acre of native prairie will intercept 53 tons of water during a one inch per hour rain event. That's a heavy rain event. So that's a, you know, that is nature's sponge 
Um, forests can't even take water up that rapidly. So um, grasslands are very important for water infiltration and water retention. Um, the biodiversity of grasslands is also very important for that as well. And I just want to kind of keep that at top of mind. So that's where I'm going to end, Michael, and I'm going to hand it back over to you. Thanks very much, Nancy. So we're going to go local now and uh, invite Jamie and Jared to speak uh, about the specific water assets and challenges uh, on the presentation heights. Thank you, Michael. Share my screen here. It always disconnects me, so bear with me one more second here. <laughs> Everybody see my screen okay? Yep. All right, wonderful. So uh, as we alluded to yesterday, uh, we had a kind of a dry season last year and we've had a little bit more of a wet season this year. We wanted to dive in a little bit more to the dry season that we had last year. And I wanted to start with these images here. Um, these images were both taken on May 19th, just shortly before we did our uh, warm season planting on Presentation Heights in Aberdeen. And the image on the left, it's kind of another highlight of the ground that we were working with. We had already killed the brome grass and we were coming in behind it to seed. So you see three separate uh, seeding tracks here. Um, what you'll notice here um, and what we found working on presentation heights is the top layer of the dirt there is about an inch of it. It's kind of sandy and then below that it ends up being almost kind of clayish. Um, but when we were doing our seeding, uh, it was very clear that uh, there wasn't a lot of airspace within the land or within the dirt. Um, and I keep saying dirt because I think I want to make it clear to everybody that we're kind of working to repair it to what we call soil. And um, so that's the image on the left. The image on the right um, is actually something that Jamie and I learned maybe the hard way this last year. Um, we had done a couple of different digs like this. This picture on the right is the first of those. Um, we had the grasslands and we had more of our wetland areas. And we were really surprised here on May 19th when we dug into the dirt. You can actually see that it looks quite moist and there's a lot of little uh, grass hairs that are down there. Um, we did this same type of study in where the reeds were. And when we dug into that area closer to the wetland, we found it was completely dry. And Jamie and I were sitting there going, what is going on? We don't understand this. And like I said yesterday, we didn't know any better. So we got to ask the people that uh, know what they're doing. When we did that, what we found out is that the grass that we had killed wasn't sucking up any moisture. It wasn't growing. Therefore, the dirt below it was going to remain moist. And this, what I have in my hand here is probably about a two inches down. So even two inches down, there was still water there. It just wasn't going anywhere. Now look at the ground that we had in the reeds. Those were actively growing, they're pulling water up. That's why that ground was dry. So it kind of was a reverse thought process for how Jamie and I had to look at what we were doing on the property. And as we showed you yesterday, we didn't have many plants that uh, were able to grow, but the ones that did uh, were able to get their uh, roots down deep uh, Nancy just showed you the different types of plants that uh, grow deep into the prairie, some as deep as 15 feet. They were able to seek out that water and then bring it up. Um, Jamie is going to speak to it here very shortly, but what I did want to highlight for you is the fact that we did our planting in May, and really we had maybe one rain event the whole summer up until August. And that's where I'm going to turn it over to Jamie, because while we've just talked about uh, what would be the challenge of water on the heights? Um, I think she has maybe the more positive spin on what we saw at the end of, of that uh, time period. Thanks, Jared. Yeah, so it was pretty um, bleak for us. It was not a good start. Um, faith was one thing that Jared and I both are very strong with. So a lot of prayer kept going on in our days when we were on the land or when we were not on the land. So again, think of the end of May and really not much 
of any sort of rainfall was happening. I got the idea that <clears throat> we have an artesian well that is on Presentation Heights. It's the waterway underneath, uh, below surface. And I discussed with Jared as I was in Aberdeen, and I said, what do you think about um, if I go and get garden hose? Well, I don't think Jared realized I was gonna go get 600 feet of garden hose. So I went to runnings in Aberdeen and I um, had a cart or two full of hose. And I banded those two together and three and four and just kept doing that, hooked it up to the artesian well, pulled it out to a section of land that we kind of staked out a 10 by 10 spot because we were still new enough in this position that we didn't know if our seed was gone or if we could even see if anything was gonna come up. So with the help of Carter Johnson from SDSU, he thought this was a great idea. Let's do a 10 by 10 section. So we did, I pulled that hose out there and put a um, fan sprinkler out on the land, turned on the spigot over 600 feet away and went over there and prayed, please let the pressure go all the way through this hose. And man, it burst out just like a small well. It was so, it was awesome. And you know what, even to smell the water was such a, I still can feel and I still can sense it in my head today because there hadn't been any water on that land for so long. So it watered and it watered and it was watering and asked the help of our presentation people to help us with watering it. And then I decided, you know what, on that weekend, there was supposed to be a potential storm coming in. So runnings, I went back to and got the biggest largest rain gauge I could find and it was on sale because they hadn't used them so I stuck <laughs> it in the ground and I said sent an email to our sisters on our prayer line and said please pray for a little moisture to come to our land and it did the skies opened um, it was interesting again our presentation people were so awesome they were sending us pictures here's august 25th an inch and we used this little marker by our you can see a little yellow of our partridge pea right next to it too and you can see a little yellow in the background of another partridge pea that were sticking their little heads up and lo and behold the rains came and wow were we thankful the next uh, picture down with me, I was back up there again another week and we kept continuing to get rain in Aberdeen and it was almost an overabundance. But again, we are not complaining, but again, we were worried what our seed now flowed out. I think Jared and I were tossed and turned into different areas, but never ever did we quit believing that this was gonna work. We had to cheer each other up once in a while, but we never lost true faith in what was going to happen. And that was truly from the help of our sisters as well. So this was kind of the beginning for us from the drought and learning how to handle flooding. Thank, Thank you, Jamie. You. Mm -hmm. That's great. All right, Michael, I will, you are a host once again. Great, thank you, Jamie and Jared. So we've talked a little bit about uh, some of the uh, data surrounding the water in the prairie uh, biomes and ecosystems and some of the experiences that Jared and Jamie have had. Uh, just gonna move for, for a while to reflect, reflect ethically about water. And we know that from a global perspective, the protection of water, the availability of water uh, to people is an enormous uh, global issue. There's millions of people on the planet that do not have ready access to safe um, uh, drinking water. So that's an enormous task that um, the United Nations works on and, and lots of NGO corporations and that Pope Francis is really focused on a lot in. He focuses on that in Laudato Sea. I want to bring the water question a little bit more, I guess you might, the ethical question a little bit more on a personal level and maybe a little bit more local. And uh, by just starting to remind um, us that we're going to follow Pope Francis in really uh, 
beginning our reflections on our on the moral life by recognizing that morality it's really it's really birthed in our hearts and and that is in our affective response to our our family and our our children our neighbors the value of people in our lives and in our communities and then to draw the natural in world into that that into our hearts in that kind of a loving relationship and you know it, it, uh, what we do with with our moral uh, lives this valuing heart when we move forward is uh, we really we really make life choices and and things get complicated you know we 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 have to make goal choices and about what we want to pursue and those become moral questions for us what's the right thing the good thing and there are principles that we uh, arrive at, we develop in our lives as we begin to work with people in relationships with others, honesty and, and uh, uh, respecting rights. These are critical uh, principles for citizenship and, and our personal lives. And then, you know, particularly within our, our Catholic tradition, the formation of virtues that we, we really hope to convey uh, in our lives through the way we live and, and that we try to communicate to our children. So from that birthing in the heart, it's it's like a plant too, and it, it, it grows and sprouts into our lives in these various directions, the, our moral energies. But I'll tell you, in my life, and I know you can relate to this, in our day-to-day -day actions, uh, we don't always reflect the goals and the principles and the virtues that we claim to value. Uh, getting uh, uh, really the journey toward achieving an integral ecology is difficult because the journey of becoming an integral person is difficult. Uh, the earth, the fate of the earth is so linked to the fate of our own moral uh, growth. And that's so true in, in uh, uh, reflecting on ethics and water. I want to uh, move to yesterday. I did a little art uh, reflection. I want to show a cartoon and, and do a kind of similar reflection here to draw out some of these challenges that we face uh, in in integrating our consistency of our lives with our beliefs. This uh, uh, I'll show it right here. Just enjoy this uh, cartoon for a moment. Jamie, why are you smiling so much? <laughs> you can relate. <laughs> it was a good, a good comic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like cartoonists, like uh, this happens to be the Wall Street Journal's Matty Bucello, and, and he, like good political or social cartoonists, he uses satire. And, and what it often does is it exposes kind of our moral evasions like we sometimes commit in our personal lives and we commit in our social institutions where we, uh, where, you know, these cartoonists expose these evasions. And I think they also kind of nudge us toward moral growth. Like we, we can laugh at ourselves, but at the same time, oh my God, you know, maybe I should do something about this kind of thing. So anyway, I, I over the next three minutes and Jared will be our, our timekeeper again. Um, if you can just look at this cartoon, and there's a couple of questions I, I have I'll show on the right for you to reflect on. And after three minutes or so, we'll just briefly discuss, share your thoughts, uh, either by hearing from you or, or you can put them in the chat box. Um, like, how would you describe the moral evasion that um, Busella is depicting in this cartoon if you were to ask to explain it to somebody? And then, um, and if the characters in this cartoon were nudged toward moral growth, what would change? So if you could think about that for about three minutes and then let's reconvene and, and chat. Okay. So I've started our timer and it appears that our chat function is working much better today. So as you get closer to the time, feel free to start using the chat to drop your thoughts in. And uh, we'll have Michael lead us back when we come back here. Thank you.
And there's our time, Michael. Great, thank you, Jared. Well, we've got um, we've got five minutes if we want to use it to just he uh, hear from one another um, your responses to these questions or thoughts about this cartoon. Um, I am not looking at chat, so if anybody, if I don't know, Nancy, are you looking at the chats? I, I can read to you too as well. Okay, if you want to raise any of those or if anybody also wants to raise their hand. Then yeah, I'll start in the chat here since I've got a good list of responses going. Okay. Um, Nancy had said, we have come to rely on what is within the law to guide us ethically, uh, yet our laws are not always just. I had stated maybe ethics would be the only group meeting to see the idea. Susan Cruz had added, moral growth comes with a lit, lively debate about the spirit of, and intent of what we do, learning what happens on both sides, and we can come to a better answer. Sister Vicki Larson said the two men would be making the policy or decision in conversation with a broader representation of diverse people in a way that meets the needs of the community and the common good. Sister mm -hmm. Vicki, thank you for always bringing that forward. Um, mm -hmm. Mary Eiley, I find it interesting that the two people in the cartoon are only old white men. Uh, Jamie uh, Rissi had added, I would like to see the men in the suits come out and explore the land and maybe not so much as the members on the paper. I feel like we have forgotten how to walk and listen. I love that, Jamie. Sister Peggy, this looks to be a corporate conversation where profit is the bottom line rather than always guided by impact on the common good. Sister Mary Yeager, thank you again for being vocal today. Ethics would be the first priority and drive all others. To stand in one place for a long time or walking long distances or lifting and stooping down, such as outdoor activities like pulling weeds, et cetera, those would drive other decisions. Uh, Sister Janet Horseman, dealing with the legality of something is often easier and less demanding than wrestling with the ethical demands. And uh, Rita uh, Menard, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, she said, We have many wants inside of us that are in conflict. We want money and riches, but also want to be good to others. These can be in conflict and we evade the conflict by sprinting past ethics and the moral consequences. Mm -hmm. there, there is a positive in this though that I think I'm seeing. There is a potted plant on the floor next to the desk. I'm praying it's real and that they are watering that. <laughs> One positive. <laughs> good catch. <laughs> I Thank was you, thinking for uh, briefly feedback. too about um, um, sometimes we we can kind of scoff at mission statements like they're just um, kind of so big and so general, but uh, they do they do matter, don't they? When we when we have a mission statement and we check check what we're doing against that, you know, maybe these two guys uh, they're not really invested in a mission. <laughs> Um, uh, Maurice, it's got a hand raised. Maurice, I apologize. The uh, chat is not allowing me to unmute you. Are you able to type your question or your thought into the chat? Michael, I'll kind of watch it. If uh, Maurice's comment comes up in the chat, I'll bring it forth. I good, apologize. Good. Okay, thank you, everybody. I'm going to move on then um, from this little kind of starter cartoon to um, to kind of you know take that that um, idea of the law and the ethics and the challenge of moral evasion. And I, I was just there's a situation that I would like us to consider. Um, I did a little research on this. The South Dakota Department of Environment and Natural Resources and the US EPA uh, Enforcement and Compliance uh, History Database show that in the last quarter where water was assessed at Aberdeen, which was a year ago spring, uh, Aberdeen tap water was in compliance. 
uh, with um, federal health-based drinking water standards. Yet, um, of the 11 contaminants detected in Aberdeen's water, and, and there's always water de contaminants detected in water, but four of those actually exceed uh, the Environmental Working Group's health gu guidelines. And, and the Environmental Working Group, you might want to look into this organization. They're, they've been around since 92. And um, they, they bring, they're a nonprofit, nonpartisan group of ecological and social scientists and attorneys and data specialists. And they're really dedicated to bringing kind of the most current environmental research uh, into the hands of American citizens. Uh, often the research, you know, it stays with specialists and it takes so long to, to kind of seep down into us normal folks. And uh, they, they try to make that research available to us so we can make informed decisions uh, about our environments and our, and our, our, our health. And what's, what was kind of shocking to me was as far as the environmental working group is concerned, uh, the chromium level of in, in Aberdeen's water is about 30 times higher than its own health guideline. Uh, now it does meet the, uh, well, there's no legal limit, which sadly on, on chromium right now, but there needs to be. Uh, as far as the legal limit of 60 uh, um, points per billion uh, of, of haloacetic acid, uh, is HAA5. And Aberdeen's 172 times what the health guideline is for, uh, according to the EWG. And, and the, the haloacetic acid 9 is, is really pretty um, outrageous, 368 times higher. Uh, and the trihomomethanes uh, is about 96 higher. Now, the, the chromium that's coming from uh, toxic metals. Uh, and the uh, haloacetic acids and the, the trihalomethanes uh, are an unfortunate unintended consequence of chlorinated water. You know, we need to chlorinate our water to get rid of microbial um, uh, material. But one of the effects of that is when the, chrome, when, when the um, uh, chlorine, chlorine meets organic materials, it can create uh, these kind of toxic uh, uh, chemicals. Now, uh, I guess my punchline here is on the, uh, on the one hand, it's, this is something that um, we should look at a little further and I'll do that later, but it just points out that, you know, being in legal compliance uh, doesn't always mean being safe and, and legal limits for contaminants in tap water they actually haven't been updated in 20 years. So, so um, we're behind the latest research findings in terms of uh, you know, monitoring our tap water. Now what that, um, uh, what that raises for me is in my life is, is the virtue of courage. Like looking at that, um, I can, uh, Uh, I, I, you know, in, in Healing Earth, we, we try to say that, you know, courage is really a, a, an important virtue of our character, it, it, that we, it contributes to the well-being of ourselves and the natural world. And, and Pope Francis, uh, which, who I um, wanted to look at also on this, is he said in a general audience about a, a, a year ago, um, it's a common misconception to consider courage a virtue exclusive to the hero. Uh, in fact, the daily life of every person, you, me, all of us, requires courage. One can't live without courage, and we need to, it to face our difficulties every day. And, and the reason I bring this up is um, it takes courage to match our day-to-day -day actions with the goals and principles that um, we value. And, and, and like our journey toward achieving integral ecology, becoming an integral person really takes courage. And, you know, Pope Francis challenges us to, to be encouraged. 
that is to be strong and respectful and adversaries of moral evasion. Uh, I, I love the, the Saint, uh, Sister Roxana's prayer about, you know, please, God, disturb us. And, and, and please, God, you know, push us into being really strong but respectful adversaries of moral evasion. Now, I'll tell you, being from North Dakota and being raised in, in Fargo with my German-Russian father and my Norwegian mother, um, being outspoken is not part of the, a lifestyle. You know, you tend to be a little bit more passive. You tend to be a little bit more accepting. And uh, But to be an adversary of moral evasion in a respectful way, um, you know, I personally really, I've had to work at that in my life. And, and, and really to be, to, to work against this tendency of um, evading, not rocking the boat. And, and um, being a strong, respectful adversary of moral evasion. And one of the graces that I've, <laughs> I've had in, in being able to participate in this um, seminar is thinking back to, to my time with the Presentation Sisters in high school. And, uh, um, other than Sister Rosario saving me from a failed chemistry career and, and Sister Timothy giving me a little bit of biology, uh, Sister Yvonne Nelson, when I think back, she was a real hero. And some of you may, may remember her. She was a Fargo uh, presentation sister. She passed away in 2008. But I want to give you a little vignette about how she impacted so many of us. Uh, I was in the class of 71. but. Um, uh, you may, those of you that have been on this planet long enough may remember that back in the early 60s, um, uh, they began the Minuteman missile program in North Dakota. And, and by the time that all those missiles were, they started construction in 62. And I actually remember a military official um, from the Minot Air Force Base coming to our house and talking to my parents about putting a miss, Minuteman missile silo on our farm on my, my, my mother was caretaker for my grandmother's farm. And, and they, you know, they, of course, that was patriotic. You know, you wouldn't think of doing anything else. You know, those were 65,000 pound missiles that went in 80 foot silos. They had three nuclear offensive warheads on each, uh, uh, each of those missiles. And by the time they were done putting all those Minuteman missiles into North Dakota, which they really got kind of wrapped up in 65, they, they, they were quick. Uh, there were 300 missiles in North Dakota with these three warheads and it made, it, the, the, at the time, it made North Dakota the third largest nuclear power in the world after the country of the United States and the country of the Soviet Union. It was crazy. And and in, in the, in, in the anti War um, movement begins in, in 65 when the U.S. troops are sent into Vietnam. And of course, a target of that anti-war movement was these mis Minuteman missiles. And uh, well, lo and behold, in, six, in, in 1970, uh, the, the U.S. government decides to really increase its uh, military face by creating an anti-ballistic missile system. The, uh, the, the, the missiles that would, would go up into the air and intercept incoming offensive weapons. So in 1970, there was a big uh, anti-ballistic missile site uh, uh, built uh, in, um, in Nakoma, North Dakota in, in April of 70. Now, the re I'm sorry to bring all this up, but the reason I mention it is Sister Yvonne suggested to us, she was our English teacher. She suggested to us that we go to Nakoma and protest uh, that the construction on a Saturday that we drive out there and protest the construction of this ABM missile site. And uh, it was kind of, I think the first time that I had a, 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 an adult suggest that I kind of step out and um, rocked the boat, so to speak. And uh, we went, a number of us in her English class went and she was there and, and we held up signs and I'd never done anything like that in my life. It was, I thought I was kind of scary going out there, but once we did it, we all got enthusiastic and we were really shouting. 
And you can imagine what my mom and dad said when I came home. Where have you been today? Uh, well, I was out at Nakoma. We were protesting. And you were doing what? And, uh, and well, Sister Yvonne was with us. Who? What? <laughs> this was not their, their expectation of how um, a nun led, this, led students. At, but that was, you know, the, the era. And in 19... Uh, uh, You'll, I mean, you'll all remember this iconic uh, uh, and horrible photograph from the Kent State, State shooting in May 4th of 1970. This is all happening so rapidly. And it's in our, you might say it's in our water. And, and instead of like passively neglecting this reality, Sister Yvonne brought it to, our, brought it to us as, as young people. And the Kent State shooting was was a May fourth, which was a Monday. And I remember that on Wednesday there was a there was a student march at Moorhead State College. And Sister Yvonne led us out of her English class, and we got Sister Am, uh, Brother Ambrose to let us out of the algebra class, and we had a study hall. So we went over to Moorhead State, and we we joined the march uh, uh, post Kent State's shooting. And uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, take it a little bit long on this, but I wanted just to say, you know, she really inspired us to take up the, the never ending challenge of becoming more integral persons. You know, that's what she was really about, uh, trying to integrate our beliefs with our actions. And this was new to us. And she went on, actually, the year I graduated in 71, she went on, as some of you know, who are in the presentation, community, went down to Kentucky for 25 years in Berea, Kentucky, and worked with uh, poor people in the Appalachian region. And, and in fact, water was a big issue in the communities that she worked with there. Um, and we, many of us kept uh, touch with her over the years. She's, a, she's a really a hero to us to make, try to help us make our actions match our beliefs. I um, want to then now move to uh, with that, uh, which I think is certainly connected to uh, the spiritual dimension, uh, to reflect a bit spiritually on this whole business of, of water and uh, moral integrity. And to do that, uh, I just want to remind folks about how we're approaching spirituality here uh, using the Healing Earth textbook. It's kind of multidimensional, you know, our deepest beliefs about the meaning of the natural world, our personal experiences of awe and, and that relationship we have with God uh, and, and, and nature. And we've invited, um, uh, again, we're going to do each of those steps here briefly, and we've invited Jamie and Jerry to just briefly share some of their own thoughts on how this engagement with water on the heights has kind of touched their their inner lives. Thank you, Michael. We're going to transition here very briefly. All right, Jamie. Thank you. So. Uh, Jared, myself, and Sister Janice had gone up to Gay Brown's ranch. Um, Gay Brown is a renowned um, rancher that has um, kind of capitalized on his 5,000 acres of um, cover crop. And he's really shown how it works and how you just don't do it overnight. It's everything is a slow grow and a slow change. But he has been doing this for several years um, with his um, son and his oh. wife as well. So on the left, you're seeing Gabe standing in a wheat field. Um, it is his neighbor's wheat field. And again, it was a, a, a windy, warm day in North Dakota. And as we're standing there, you can notice that the ground, I, again, sorry, Nancy, I have to call this dirt. You can see that it looks just dry and, and hot. So we did a soil test. He actually had a little um, gauge and we tested the soil temp because this farmer thought he was doing a good thing because he was doing no-till, which is a good first step, but he wasn't covering that 
soil in between his crop of, of wheat, that round, um, that ground temp was about 171 degrees. It was like burning that poor plant that was trying to grow. That wheat was burn, burning. I put my hand on it and it actually, it was hot to the touch. So then we went across over to an area where he has done his cover crop planting. And what he has done here, mind you, he has got multiple things. It's a, it's a, a menagerie of, of different um, from, oh gosh, I can't even remember all the different plants he had put in this, Jared. But I just want to kind of explain to you that when we walked into this field, I actually felt like my legs were being air conditioned. It was so incredibly cooler standing there. And yet the sun's warmth was actually not as horrible as it was standing over in that wheat field where it was very warm and I actually began to perspire. And so we took the temp of this um, as we could separate everything and we separated it and it was like at 73 degrees. It was truly saying that a cover crop keeps that moisture down as Nancy said earlier, those roots are absorbing everything and it's coming up and building this beautiful um, acre, I don't even remember how many acres right now, but the, the point is, is that this was keeping moisture down into the ground and giving this land room to grow. And the other thing is they have only had, oh, a, a few inches of rain. So it's not as high as it really should be, but look at even next to Gabe, it shows you that it was growing even with the lack of rain that was coming from the sky. It was a fabulous day to learn on his, on his ranch. Thank you, Jamie. Mm -hmm. So the next slides here, um, this is just a different perspective on that same field that Jamie just showed you uh, with pictures of Gabe. Um, the field that uh, we were standing in is about 30 acres. And like Jamie said, uh, Gabe had planted, I think it was about 20 different species. He's got a vast variety of things that would be too long for me to share. But the reason I wanted to show you this other perspective of the field is we're talking right now about finding meaning in water. Um, Nancy talked a little bit ago about our watershed and how that affects people downstream uh, and how it can affect. We talked yesterday about, you know, looking globally, but thinking locally, right? Um, this field here that Gabe has, has a really cool capacity. Um, I don't want to speak inaccurately to what his biomass of variety is in the soil, but Gabe had said they've done tests on his property that show that they could take 30 inches of water per hour and infiltrate it into the ground and they would not run off. Now, given what Nancy has already shared with us, to me, that is still a staggering statistic and I've actually walked this land. So mm -hmm. it is, um, it shows you what you can have uh, in effect on a small scale. Now, bring that back to what we're doing on presentation heights. Um, we're using, you know, the skills we're learning from people like Gabe, uh, from people uh, like uh, uh, Pete Bauman with the uh, South Dakota Soil Health and the SDSU Extension Office, uh, what we're learning from people like uh, Carter Johnson, who also worked with SDSU and continues to uh, work in the field of ecology. Um, but the reason I bring it back to Aberdeen, finding meaning in water. Through the property in Aberdeen, we have a small creek that runs. Moccasin Creek runs through our property. Uh, it drains probably the most of the northwest side of Aberdeen. It runs through the middle eastern side of Aberdeen, where it joins then the Jim River south of town near Redfield. And then it flows into the uh, Big Sur River, which then flows into the Missouri and into the Mississippi. So you can see that we are all connected. So everything that even we are doing up in Aberdeen can have an effect downstream. Now, while Jamie and I have or only been working on our project about 15 months, uh, Gabe's field here has been uh, worked in the same process for over 15 years. So you can see that while we have room to grow, we are starting and it's our hope that long-term that uh, we can show changes in our property. Um, Jeff Zimprick, who is the former uh, head of the NRCS offices here in South Dakota, has given us a really cool little tool. It's an infiltration test. Uh, basically, you put an inch of water in the bottom of this tin. You put that inch of water on top of cellophane. When you're ready, you pull the cellophane out and you watch how fast that water can infiltrate. Um, we did a no-till field out in Jeff Zimprick's farm. 
that no-till field, it took about uh, 45 minutes to infiltrate one inch of water. We moved literally 10 feet from that where we had seen uh, all of the topsoil blow into, and it was an area of undisturbed uh, prairie. That water infiltrated in a minute and a half, that same inch of water. So again, these are practices that um, we're working on, that we're working on growing. But if you draw it all back to the meaning of water, it, the bottom line is what we do locally does affect globally, and we have to keep that focus. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Okay. Being a, an ecologist, Nancy has spent so much time on this earth and seen so many different ecosystems and, and, and beautiful things. We've asked her to just reflect briefly on uh, her experience of, of um, water awe. And uh, she asked, invited me to put this picture up. Thank you, Mike. Um... I do spend time on the Great Lakes and have studied the Great Lakes now for, gosh, about 30 years. This is a picture um, uh, of pictured rocks, which is on um, the north shore of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, looking out over Lake Superior. And for me, um, this is a very spiritual, place because um, that water, that body of water, it's the largest of the Great Lakes. It's very deep. It's spring fed. And so the water is very pristine and clean and clear. And it's very cold. Um, and when storms come up, they're incredibly powerful. Um, and when you try to get into that water, it's so cold, you know, it just kind of shocks you. But I find this to be, um, it, it inspires awe because of the beauty and the, the majesty and the size and the pristine nature of this body of water. And I just hope that we can always keep it clean and pristine. Um, so Lake Superior for me is where God is. And mm. it kind of hits you right in the face. It's so easy to see that and to feel that and to feel blessed by it when, when you're in that water. I just wanted to share that with you. I don't know how many people have experienced Lake Superior, but of all the great lakes, it's, it's the way it should be. You know, it's way, it's the way all the, all five of the great lakes should be, but we have so much human impact on the others um, they're not quite as clean and, and cold and beautiful as this one. Thank you, Nancy. I want to say just a few, just briefly, some words about ritual and water. And uh, for, for many years, my wife and I, we were in charge of the kind of the baptismal ministry at our parish. So we were uh, preparing young couples for the baptism of their children, you know, and giving them some lessons on what the sacrament of baptism means and all that and and um, it was it was beautiful um, when I when I started hanging out with ecologists and and um, um, tried to learn some little bit of chemistry which is still hard for me but learning that the properties of water, this solvency, that water is a universal solvent and it dissolves more substances than any other liquid and that it's a its polarity allows the water molecule to be attracted to so many different molecules. It dissolves substances. It's I, I uh, it's it's one time when the chemistry of something really grabbed me, and I think in part it grabbed me because I thought, oh, so that's that's why we baptize with water. It, it it's this wonderful link between the natural properties of 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 something that God has given us and linking it to what we try to express, uh, you know, symbolically uh, in a spiritual way through our, our water and ritual uh, uh, purification rites. And, and certainly we, that relationship between the natural features of water and its ritual uses, to me, it's so cool. 
we obviously in Christian baptism, it's a purification rite, and there's a Jewish mikvah where uh, uh, someone that converts to Judaism, and this goes back to ancient ancient Hebrew times, of, has to have a purification bath. Um, and, and we know with Muslims, there's a, there's the daily ablution before prayer, and that's a cleansing of the soul uh, and the body. Uh, uh, this is a, uh, a Hindu uh, uh, ritual in Tamu Nadu, where uh, before you know prayer, you, you uh, cleanse yourself to purify. In 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 Bali, which I was blessed to be able to visit one time, uh, the Hindus there. Their water ritual, they actually have got so many beautiful waterfalls there. They lean against this waterfall and they let the water run over their heads. And then they're understanding it's a purification of anxiety. It's a purification of depression. It purifies them of, even if they've had bad dreams, it, it cleanses them of that before they um, meet the day, really. Um, this is a great, uh, with the Japanese Shinto, uh, in, in Shinto religion, before you begin your morning prayer, you have a water ritual of, of cleansing. And I, I was at, uh, you know, Standing Rock during the No Dapple protest and, uh, you know, we were freezing, uh, but every morning at seven, you know, you, got, you had to get up and the Anishinaabe or, you know, the Ojibwe people from northern Minnesota were there and they made us go down to the Cannonball River and have a water ritual. Uh, uh, it, but it was, of course, it was very beautiful to, to pray with uh, with uh, Anishinaabe folks. And and this goes back to ancient times. Uh, this is, you know, the the... The Egyptian tombs, what are we talking about? The uh, pyramids going back to the second millennium BC. And then there's all of this uh, artistry showing the, the role of water in purification uh, in, in ancient times. So I, I think we pray together. It's a great interreligious reality is, is when, when, we, when we use water to purify, we're, we're really praying with the religions of the world. Well, let's get active. Uh, let's, uh, we've gone through uh, some, uh, again, a little bit of scientific reflection and ethics and spirituality. Now's our time to, to kind of look at uh, how, could we, how could we protect water in a better way in our, in our daily lives? And, and then maybe we can reflect on that together. But um, certainly we want to hear from Nancy uh, and she has offered this slide for us to look at. There are many small actions that we can do in our own homes, in our own lives, in our own behavior. And we can, we can teach our children and our family how to be more uh, respectful of and conservative of water, um, especially living in an arid environment. One thing that you can do on your home is to connect your down downspouts that come off of your roof with a rain barrel. It's a pretty simple thing that you can, you know, do it yourself. Um, you can use that water then to water your gardens rather than just taking the finished drinking water that comes from our waste, our, our drinking water treatment plants and, um, you know, and using that to water our gardens. You can also plant the prairie forbs, the flowering plants with, that have such deep roots in your garden because they're more resistant to drought and they're better at retaining water in the soil. If you're really ambitious, you can collect gray water, which is the used water that come, that is in your sinks and showers and your dishwasher, your laundry, washing machine, you can collect that water and also use that on your landscapes. Um, it might have a little food scraps in it or so, a little bit of soap or detergent, but if you get a biodegradable detergent, it's perfectly fine to put that on your uh, landscape and on your soil and it won't hurt your plants. I would suggest soaker hoses are much more efficient than sprinklers, especially in hot climates where you have a lot of uh, water vapor and evaporation. When you use a, a sprinkler that goes into the air, a lot of that water gets evaporated and doesn't actually uh, make its way down into the soil. Soaker hose will um, be much more efficient at getting that water directly at the base of the roots of the plants. Um, I would also suggest that, um, not, not using 
fertilizers or at least using them very sparingly and not using chemicals on your landscapes to, to keep any runoff or infiltrating water clean so that it doesn't pollute the aquifer, it doesn't pollute the runoff that goes ultimately down to uh, the Mississippi River. And then finally, maybe people don't own a, a yard or um, a place where they can do any of this kind of jerry-rigging of your own plumbing. Um, if you're renting a place, for example, or living in a community, you may not be able to do this, but you could donate to some of these really terrific organizations that are doing a lot of work to protect um, our waterways. And, and these are just a few of them. The Natural Resources Defense Council, they do a lot to uh, defend natural resources, not just water, but land as well. The Alliance for the Great Lakes is very specific to the Great Lakes, but um, for me, I have a real fondness with them and, and I do support their work. Riverkeeper is a really interesting organization that um, takes students who are in law school and puts them on boats that go up and down the major rivers of North America and Central America. Um, and they kind of sleuth out the industries that are um, unlawfully dumping waste into rivers at nighttime. And then the students sue the, the, the companies. And it's super gratifying because the students don't get their law degree until they've successfully done one of these lawsuits and Riverkeeper has really been diligent at cleaning up the Hudson River as, meant, as well as many of the big um, river waterways uh, in the United States and Mexico. Great, thanks, Nancy. Looking forward to hearing from Jamie and Jared too. Thank you, Michael. So you see a glass being filled with water. You see it, water on the, on the countertop. I take mine a step where Nancy was so awesome telling us the different ways. I feel we need to teach this to our little people. I always think of my grandchildren, or maybe it's your sons or daughters or whoever, nieces, nephews. How do we teach them to conserve water? If they watch what we do on a daily basis, they're not going to learn. So what we started at my house, so when my children come over to see their Nana, we have a bucket that sits on the counter. And every time we finish, whether it's a snack or dinner or whatever, all the empty liquids go into this bucket. And so the bucket then is filled. And then I take my grandchildren and they take that outside and they then put it on either the shrubs or into um, my planters, whatever it would be. And I feel that if we set that precedence for them, they'll continue this as they grow and mature. And so it's another aspect of how we can involve young, small people into just a small thing of how they can learn to conserve water. Thank you, Jamie. Mm -hmm. um, what I'll add in here for action around uh, water and protecting it in our daily lives, um, my instance is uh, we've been talking a lot about yards and what you can do with them. And we've also been talking about actions and courage. Um, my hometown uh, is Del Rapids. I live a block off of our golf course uh, in town there. And that area is very well known for having a bunch of green, well manicured lawns right next to the golf course. Um, I like everybody else in that neighborhood have sprinklers in my yard. Uh, but this summer, um, I chose to do things a little bit differently, uh, given what I've been learning about uh, ecology, land, land restoration, and um, just, again, what impact I'm having on the environment. So um, this past June, I shut off my water system. I haven't yet turned it back on. I don't plan to, but I will tell you, I have the brownest yard in my neighborhood. And I had to both trust and pray uh, about what might come. And lo and behold, we had rains yesterday. We've had rains over the last couple of weeks. And I have not spent money on watering my lawn. I have not uh, been out there having to mow it as frequently, therefore expending more gas with my mower. Um, I know it's not dead. <laughs> so uh, lo and behold, with the rains we've had recently, my lawn is coming back and it looks just, just fine comparative to everybody else's. But I will tell you, uh, I've gotten a few scoffs from my neighbors on both sides. Um, 
it has taken me a little courage not to do anything. But I just <laughs> want to throw out there, everybody, you know, try to do little things like that. It's not always the big things. Like uh, Nancy said, it's act locally. It's the small things that will add up periodically if we all pitch in over time. Great. I'm bringing it back to you, Michael, one sec. Thank you. Great. There we are. So just briefly, uh, I'm going to uh, make a little contribution to this discussion. Uh, going back to our issue with the water in <laughs> Aberdeen, uh, uh, one thing you could, uh, I, I would do, uh, and uh, I hope, would be to, first of all, I'd be curious to know whether the environmental working group's findings are credible. So I'd have to double check on that. Uh, and and, um, and also, uh, are the, you know, are these findings really concerning to me? And at least on the face they are. So at least one action that I would take, I'd, I'd feel, try to filter out these contaminants at my home. And, um, I discovered that water filters can reduce these contaminant levels. So you can get an activated charcoal or activated carbon um, water filtration. And I guess from, from the EWG, it will filter out most of these, of these really dangerous uh, chemicals. But I'm gonna channel Sister Yvonne a little bit here and, um, and say, you know, I could maybe take it a step further. And, and uh, you know, not just sit on, okay, I've got it taken care of in my house, but what about it? What about the, my neighbors? You know, uh, maybe finding out the general sources of the contaminants. And, um, you know, I know that toxic waste comes from steel production. And I know there's 34 businesses in Aberdeen that fabricate steel. So you've got a lot going on there with steel fabrication. Uh, and textile dial wood preserving leather tanning you've got some Aberdeen leather tanners but, um, the um, action that uh, again it, I my default is not to to do this but I have to push myself because uh, like I said you know Father, Sister Yvonne is there today you know contact your local official um, ask about testing information from the waterworks treatment plant uh, don't be shy. Uh, uh, it's your your tax dollars. It's your community. Um, now, the city of Aberdeen does have a drinking water report from 2021 you can look at. You can even call Robert Brown, the superintendent of the water treatment plant. And uh, he puts his email there and he even gives you a phone number and call us if you have a question. So, that, you know, that might be another thing to, to take that personal um, uh, react, action of filtrating your own house water. And, push it out into citizenship. Well, we're gonna, we're, we're really close to the end of our time. I think what we'll do is kind of bring together uh, thoughts on what we've talked about scientifically and how we've evaluated ethically a little bit this morning and we've done our spiritual reflection and now our, uh, some comments about action. Uh, all part of this attempt to, to build out intracol ecology in our, in our lives. Um, do you have some water action ideas? And, and, and in the couple minutes, um, if you could, if you want to share in chat or if you want to say anything out loud, maybe a, P, a bit of information that stayed with you uh, from this morning's session or, or maybe a new thought you've had or maybe an emotion that stirred you. Uh, during our time together, uh, we've got a couple minutes if you care to share anything. Um, Michael, I'd like to jump in actually. Uh, many minutes ago, Maurice raised his hand and we weren't able to actually hear his voice, but he did type something into the chat, so I did want to read it for everybody. Good, good. Um, he talks about moral evasion, which you had kind of as a consistent message throughout your uh, talk there, Michael. But what he said was this, and again, Maurice, thank you for this. He said, this topic of moral evasion reminds me of what physicist Brian, uh, I believe it's pronounced SWIM, uh, has talked about in one of his courses, and it was this. We as Western consumers behave ecologically like we are in a restaurant, and we will, and we all want to leave the table before the bill comes. Oh, that's kind of wow. a deep thought. Wow. Thank you, Maurice. 
Thanks, Maurice. That is a that is really good. I'll also call out Sister uh, Lynn Welbig uh, here. She says, think about car washes, the weekly waste of water that are used by subscribers. Um, yeah. Water actions and ideas. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe um, if, if you have uh, time, um, put a, uh, some stirring that's going on within you in the chat, and we'll be sure to be able to look at that uh, tonight, and uh, we'll appreciate that. Well, so, uh, well, oh, Jamie, did you want to no, add something? No, no, I, you go ahead. Oh, okay. I just wanted to remind you that, you know, tomorrow we're going to pick up on uh, global climate change. It'll be our last time together. And uh, we're going to uh, follow the same uh, kind of format. We're going to talk. Nancy's going to give us some good information about carbon sequestration. We'll hear again from Jamie and Jared on, on climate change impacts on the heights. Uh, I'm going to ask us to do a little bit of a music reflection tomorrow, and we're going to talk about um, the goal of CO2 reduction as part of along with Catholic environmental ethics. We're going to look for meaning of, um, of the prairie climate in our lives and, and experiencing climate awe and prayer and, and, and the prairie climate. And then, of course, ideas on how to respond to climate change in, in our day-to-day our -day life. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Sister Roxanne for a final prayer. I, I, of course, want to thank you for letting us join you this morning. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, everyone. Um, having come from the land of 10,000 lakes, this session has been very inspiring and touched me at a very deep level. Um, I would like to close with a prayer of gratitude um, for water. So let us again remember we are always and have been in the presence of God. Without water, we would die. Water is essential for life on earth, not just human life, but all life. Water is needed for drinking, cleansing, and making crops grow. There is no substitute for this precious resource, and yet we waste it. We pollute it, and we even commodify it. Let us start anew by thanking God for the gift of water. We praise and thank you, O oh God, for the gift of living water. Guide us to use it wisely, learn from its humility, consume it with reverence, and protect its purity so that we may truly enjoy water. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, everybody.